Let's take a minute to stretch the body. I'm wondering if anyone is here for the first time. If you are, maybe you can unmute yourself and just say hello if you'd like, introduce yourself. All old timers tonight. <laughs> All right. Well, <clears throat> I'm wondering how that practice was for you. I'm wondering if there are any reflections or comments about the meditation tonight. So good to just to remember that when this you know, that natural feeling of appreciation arises when this mind sees something deeply or clearly like, oh, there's no need to be in, to be resisting the present moment. How that, that's wisdom that understands, you know, that it's really makes sense to drop the proliferation, to drop the constant becoming, right? the constant wanting something else or wanting things to be a different way. That's wisdom that knows how to do that. That nat naturally arises while the heart connects again and again and again. And one of these, you know, con re regular things that you might hear me and other people say is just how um, important it is to not try to make a project out of practice. So it's not like there's no personal effort that's needed. We do decide to, we, you know, we make decisions and we set intentions and we put forth some energy, some effort to doing the next right thing, right? Even if that next right thing is to sit down on the cushion for a while or to remember the teachings of the Buddha in some way or to ask, like, what, what teachings are relevant to me right now? What could help me? get through this moment or make sense of this reactivity or accept this reactivity. There is some effort and yet it's important to also remember that all of the experiences that we connect with are all here lawfully. And because of that, it doesn't make sense to resist any of them. It doesn't make sense to push something away, even if it's unpleasant. And in fact, what we see the longer we're on the path is that as this heart becomes more and more sensitive to the truth of our lives, we feel, we feel a lot, right? And we might feel, we might have more emotions or we might have, we might be in tune, attuned to different experience, like mind states or body sensations. I was just sitting here and feeling so much in the body and kind of amazed that this heart actually knows how to connect with all of that and receive it and feel the, the, the kind of intricacies of the body and the interplay between the heart and the, and the body, the sensations in the body. And so there's not something wrong with us if practice develops that way. That is natural. That will happen. And it's learning how to, this practice is about learning how to appreciate that sensitivity because it is a revealing of this heart that cares about life. Like, oh, it's like this. 
And so it's a steady, steady deepening into this reality that resisting sensitivity doesn't make sense either. This heart really naturally cares. So that's how we know because the heart is sensitive. We know it cares, right? We know this heart knows how to, to touch the truth of things, to touch the truth of the pain in the heart. And so I've been sharing my reflections, uh, following along in this wonderful book by Tanisa and Kitty Saro. Most of you probably know that by now, called Listening to the Heart. And yet, on the heels of the presidential debate last night, this heart felt moved to perhaps lean into a different territory. So I'd prepared something to share to continue um, on the theme of dukkha. And there's lots to say about dukkha. (laughs) And, uh, you know, we'll continue that probably tonight and, and in future weeks. But I wanted to share some reflections about just, you know, what's been moving in my heart around action and sila and ethics tonight in hopes that, again, this will be more of a conversation than a, than a Dharma talk, although I will, I will share some of my reflections. I'm hoping you will chime in and share yours too. Hmm. Santi Caro is a wonderful teacher um, who usually visits Common Ground once a year and gives some teachings, often a, a day-long workshop and a, a public talk for the community and sometimes another smaller, shorter workshop on Sunday. Uh, and hopefully, you know, when the conditions permit, he'll be able to continue doing that. And one of the things that um, I've heard Santi Caro say again and again is that the precepts are like training wheels. They don't really work unless you practice them. So when we think of, um, we might think of ethical conduct or our own integrity or the actions that we take in our lives towards skillfulness, towards our own health and well-being, towards that in our communities. We might think of these activities as um, ways of contributing some good. And in fact, these activities that we might, con- we might use our bodies, it's really just how we use our bodies, our mouths, our bodies, how our intentions, our intentions manifest in the form of action in our lives and in the world from a simple things like how we go about our day and um, benefit from our good habits, like remembering to brush our teeth or deciding to take in some healthy food and things like this to even more substantial um, contributions in the world, like our activism or, you know, our get out the vote efforts or whatever, civic responsibilities we decide to take up. And we can place these activities on the Eightfold Path. So the Eightfold Path, this is the path to freedom that the Buddha laid out for us, is divided up into three parts. One part is the cultivation of wisdom. This would be right intention or wise intention and wise view or wise understanding this cultivation of this deeper truth that Jillian was talking about, like the truth of impermanence, waking up to and appreciating like, oh, everything changes all the time. And it doesn't make sense to resist that. Resist that. And in fact, when this heart learns how to not resist that on its own, there's some relief there. 
So this is that wisdom part of the path that we cultivate ongoing. And then this second part of the path is something that we've been talking about on Wednesday night for a long time, and that's the cultivation of samadhi, or this heart that knows how to be intimate as a habit, ongoing, consistently, continuously. So the development of samadhi includes wise concentration, wise effort, and wise mindfulness, the three components. And then this third part of the path, this path of integrity, or sila, which includes right action, right speech, and right livelihood. So the ways that we spend our, the ways that we engage our body in our practice and our life. And so the path was really meant to be practiced together, all of the parts of the path working together, right, supporting the cultivation of um, wisdom and understanding, compassion, and this deepening into wisdom and compassion so that this heart really fully wakes up, understands freedom in the deepest way possible. Let's go of clinging, sets down the activities and habits of craving, and learns the reality of nature, that nature is moving and flowing all the time through us and our, through our bodies, through our hearts and the world, in the natural world, in our interpersonal world. And just what I said earlier about how there's no sense in resisting that because it's, it's here, you know, any moment that we're aware of that we're noticing, it's because there's something moving right now in the present moment, not in the past or in the future. We might have memories in the present moment about past or future, but everything that we know is right here. So we learn how to more fully embrace living in the present moment with the sensitivity of the heart, with the with the, all of the ways that this heart knows how to care and knows how to participate skillfully. So this path of, this part of the path that is about integrity is also, another way to describe that is using our our skills, our actions, our bodies to participate in harmlessness. Like how do we set in motion the aspects of well-being that contribute to a healthy, a skillful life, a healthy and a skillful community, communities, world? How do we contribute in ways that are supportive of life and not degrading or demeaning or somehow um, negating, you know, any of those words, life? And I've been curious about this intersection of racial justice very much, as many of you know, and um, the work of Ibram X. Kendi, who I haven't thoroughly digested all of it, um, but one of the primary points he makes in some of his book, um, such as How to Be an Anti-Racist, is that this, this, that action can precede attitude. Right. And in Buddhism, we often think about mind preceding action. But in some ways, we can also think about the resolves that we make to live in useful, skillful ways as action preceding attitude. And we all do this quite often. So we're cultivating and I don't even think I don't, you know, it doesn't in my mind doesn't really seem like one necessarily comes before uh, the other. But as the Buddha pointed out with uh, with the integration of the Eightfold Path, that action and cultivating, cultivating wise action and cultivating skillful mind states that relate well to our lives are important, um, can, to go concurrent, to run concurrently, right? 
And so some of the ways that we might we might see how important it is to participate skillfully, use our bodies wisely. You know, we can see this right in the middle of our daily lives. We might not always want to get up out of our bed and start our day, but we do that. We allow our bodies to take the action of rolling out of bed. We might not feel like we want to get dressed and take a shower and wake up, but we begin to do the thing because somehow we know that it's a useful thing to do, right? We might want to eat chocolate cake for breakfast, but somehow we say no to that chocolate cake and we decide to have some really savory oatmeal instead (laughs) or whatever your healthy breakfast choice might be. There's nothing wrong with eating chocolate cake for breakfast, so I'm not making a statement against chocolate cake. But just this point that we're we're often in our lives acting and allowing the attitude to follow, which is another important point that we should actually take the time to reflect on the good that our lives are setting in motion. So when it's important and useful, and I've been taking up this habit for you know the, a while now of of reflecting throughout my day, not just at the end of the day, although it's really useful to reflect at the end of a day, but throughout the day too, of like, oh, that was really a good idea, sweetie, to do that. Oh, that was a good use of time, sweetie. And just to pause in that moment and feel like, oh, oh, there's a good feeling in the heart when this heart knows how to do, to make good use of its energies. Right. When I decide to get up and and take an early morning walk with the dog, just like spending some time throughout the walk, oh, like this is good for you and you appreciate this, you know, both for my dog and for me, the exercise, the usefulness. And so the act of renunciation is a part of practice and part of our training and using our bodies and mind. In the world, renunciation is choosing to set something down or to not pick something up. And it can be, again, really concrete and simple, and simple examples of choosing not to pick up something that is going to be harmful to us in some way. And then that part of attitude following, again, is that willingness of the heart to reflect on the good our lives are setting in motion. So there are these five precepts, these five trainings that Santi Caro reminds us it's important to practice. And these are trainings around non-harm. So the traditional trainings are taking up the training not to take life, uh, taking up the training not to steal, not to lie, not to use um, our sexual energies in ways that might harm others, not to misuse intoxicants. These are the five lay precepts, meaning precepts that are useful for all human beings, regardless of your, uh, and uh, you don't need to be in monastic robes to decide to practice, right? They're good for all of us. And so I wanted to read one version of these precepts of trainings of ways that we might use our energies of body skillfully in support of our own well-being. This is a version <clears throat> written by um, Katriana Reed, uh, the Manzanita Village Precepts, a Thich Nhat Hanh community. And I would ask that I'm going to read these slowly, and I would ask that you just settle back, settle back into the posture and just really receive them and use them as reflections or inquiries. So one of the beautiful aspects of these precepts and the way they're written is that it's a broad view of life. So we can see how far-reaching this 
wonderful intention or this resolve to contribute to our own well-being can take us. So number one, aware of the violence in the world and of the power of nonviolent resistance, I stand in the presence of ancestors, the earth, and future generations and vow to cultivate the compassion that seeks to protect each living being. Number two, just letting that land in your heart. Aware of the poverty and greed in the world and of the intrinsic abundance of the earth, I stand in the presence of the ancestors, the earth, and future generations and vow to cultivate the simplicity, gratitude, and generosity that have no limits. Number three, aware of the abuse and lovelessness in the world and of the healing that is made possible when we open to love, I stand in the presence of the ancestors, the earth, and future generations and vow to call Aware of the falsehood and deception in the world and of the power of living and speaking the truth, I stand in the presence of the ancestors, the earth, and future generations and vow to cultivate the ability to listen and clarity and integrity in all I communicate by my words and actions. Aware of the contamination and desecration of the world and of my responsibility for life as it manifests through me, I stand in the presence of the ancestors, the earth, and future generations and vow to cultivate care and right action to honor and respect the health and well-being for my body and mind and the planet. And in the presence of ancestors, the earth and future generations. It's such a beautiful reminder of the interconnectedness of life. That so many people have practiced goodness and resiliency and done the best that they could and the earth has survived all these years, thankfully. And now we have this possibility of practicing and setting something in motion for future generations. It's like a, a deep, deep respect and love. And really this, <clears throat> I wanted to talk a little bit about integrity today, uh, primarily because I was influenced by this activity that some of 
the Common Ground community participated in following um, a talk by Ayo Yatunde, one of the teachers here at Common Ground, a wonderful teacher. She gave a talk a couple of Sundays ago. It's on Common Ground's website. And although I wasn't there, I was leading the Labor Day retreat with Mark. Um, one of the things that came out of it was a, a group that decided to converge on Google in, in the Google world of Google and collaborate on a love letter, a love letter to America. And so I was part of that group. I decided to jump in and Patrice was there and um, Shannon Gibney spearheaded the effort and others were there too. Yvonne, I don't know if Yvonne is here tonight. But it was a wonderful effort of um, using our skills in service of, you know, taking some action and applying that in the service of love, right? And so contributing something about our hearts, the goodness of our hearts, and what we want out of our lives, what we want for ourselves and for each other, so that our actions are grounded in this deep energy of love, the depth of which is impossible to match, right? In my experience, energies of love or of rage or anger burn out really easily. And it can feel like in moments that, especially now, we can feel enraged or super angry about any number of things going on and feel the reactivity of the heart and how uh, difficult it is to contribute when the heart is entangled in this way. And yet, paradoxically, it can sometimes seem, well, like I'm entitled to this feeling. I have this self-righteousness about having this emotion here and almost like this arrogance that this is the only way forward. And yet what we learn with practice is that we can learn to embrace all the normal human emotions and feel relaxed even when they're, when they're there. Because we understand that there's, that these emotions are also a force of nature, right? So there's some kind of wisdom and care that can meet those feelings of react that express reactivity and in moments reactivity doesn't even arise and in fact as we continue to practice what tends to happen is moments of intimacy and care gain strength and we develop this capacity this great capacity to meet all of life with the depth of love that we didn't know was possible and so Shannon started this Google Doc where people started to write together and express, and it, it was such a beautiful um, way of contributing. And one of the last things that I said to us was, uh, "We need to, we need to be a force of love that counters the hate and vitriol that we are hearing and seeing and feeling in the world." And so to remember that every time, each time we decide to practice, we decide to be intimate, to be intimate, we decide to, that it's important, it's relevant to develop the sensitivity of the heart to meet all of life, that we are cultivating this depth of care, this big courage and this capacity that is really unmatched, this, we're cultivating that right here so that we have more resources it's kind of like doing push-ups and getting stronger push-ups for the heart this present moment awareness and it's the same way practice the precepts we decide to explore them as inquiries like how does this work in my life what does it mean to be aware of poverty and greed in the world and of the intrinsic abundance of the earth? 
and to stand in the presence of ancestors, the earth, and future generations, and take a vow, some resolve, to cultivate simplicity and gratitude and generosity beyond limits. So the power of taking these into our heart, of practicing right action, right livelihood, and right speech in support of these really beautiful and useful ways of living. Even if, even if in moments we don't want to, like, oh, this feels too hard. I don't really want to do this right now. But wait, I took that vow and I care. So I'm going to do that. And I'm going to care enough to reflect throughout my day, throughout my life, about the good that this is contributing, the good that this is setting in motion. read um, a a quote here from this book by Guy Armstrong called Emptiness of Potatoes. And then this chapter on wisdom and compassion. So this coming together of this deep understanding of nature and the compassion that supports supports our willingness to continue to take action for the good of others, right? It's, it's that, and it's also this natural upwelling of care that happens naturally when the heart connects with suffering in the world, in the world, in each other, in ourselves. This heart that naturally knows how to care because of its sensitivity that's developed with practice. And this is a, a quote from Shanti Deva in, in the book. For as long as space endures, and for as long as living beings remain, until then may I too abide to dispel the misery of this world. The Dalai, Dalai Lama, it's one of his favorite passages. Just pointing to again what these wonderful precepts from the Manzanita village community are pointing to, too, that we practice for our own well-being and for the good of others. And so part of taking up the precepts and being willing to take good care of the ways that our bodies and our speech contributes in the world is a safeguard for us all. For as long as space endures and for as long as living beings remain, until then may I, too, abide to dispel the misery of the world. It's that serious resolve to really understand what we're doing when we're practicing. To not somehow think this moment doesn't matter, but to remember that every moment of our life is an opportunity for practice, not just when we're sitting on the cushion or cushion or taking a retreat or doing some formal practice. Every moment, all the moments when we make decisions about how to live, about what to do with our time, about how to talk, about how to listen, about how to connect. And then another passage from the Buddha. The Buddha says, in this way, bhikkhunis, bhikkhus, monastics, you must train yourselves. Perceiving one's own benefit, one should practice tirelessly. Perceiving the benefit to others, one should practice tirelessly. Perceiving the benefit to both, one should practice tirelessly. So it's not the self, it's not a self-centered point of view. It's a practice, an expansive practice that understands the contribution to the world, to us all. And so I'd like to open it up for your comments and questions and reflections.
Before that, I'd like to le- read the love letter. Would you like to hear the love letter? <laughs> and don't worry, it's already posted on Common Ground's Facebook page, so you can go find it there if you'd like. To our neighbors who want to be seen and heard, those we know and those we do not yet know, we hurt, grieve, and reckon together. This is a time in the spiritual and moral life of our nation which demands a recalibration of humanity, and it began on May 25th, 2020, right here in Minneapolis. We, members of the Common Ground Mindfulness Community, have been loving on the Twin twin Cities for 26 plus years. And this time invites us to deepen our love and commitment to our shared community. Given the devastating torture and murder of George Floyd, the subsequent uprisings here and elsewhere, we now have an undeniable responsibility to our collective well-being to transform our relationships and examine ways in which we may have colluded with oppressive systems. In Minneapolis, we have lived through both the righteous protests and the burning of our businesses, libraries, and police precincts. We have gathered with our neighbors to organize block shifts to keep each other safe during white supremacist attacks and in the process have actually gotten to know them better. We honor the resolve among the young, black, queer, trans, and elder organizations of the Defund the Police movement. At the same time as we watch division increase in these communities, and people grow more and more frightened of each other, sabotaging our community, our capacity to remember our common humanity and to make deep change. We are aware that in the shadow of the worst pandemic the world has ever seen and the world has seen in over 100 years, almost one in eight households do not have enough to eat. We weep for the now almost 1 million dead worldwide and 200,000 dead in our borders from the virus numbers that keep growing every day. We have also been distressed by the ongoing homelessness and housing crisis throughout the Twin Cities metro area, and in fact, the whole state. And all the while, we have been active agents in all that has transpired as well, trying our best to accept what we call the Dharma, or the way it is, while at the same time not contributing to the suffering piling up around us and inside us. We do not have the antidote to all the hurt that keeps exploding, particularly in our most vulnerable BIPOC and working class communities. But we wonder and dream what might be possible if more of us could hold our pain more skillfully when it comes up, instead of instantly reacting to it in ways that harm ourselves and others. In mindfulness training, we pay attention to the sensations in the body. We study ethics and non-harming. We try not not to commit acts of violence just because we're angry or frustrated. For many of us, our practice has allowed us to sit with our grief in ways we haven't been able to before. This, in turn, allows the grief to move within and outside us, thus making us space for something new to emerge. We have lost children, parents, livelihoods, and even at times the belief that a more just world is possible. But in coming back to mindfulness teachings, we learn over and over again to really be kind to ourselves in our most tender moments. In this practice, we learn to have compassion for ourselves and others and not to harm ourselves and others. This is the deep listening that all of us yearn for in these difficult times, particularly those with little or no safety net. We write you from a deep heart of compassion and loving kindness because we want all of us to be well, safe from harm and living our best lives. But we know there are many external challenges. What we can offer are resiliency practices from our worlds of contemplation, meditation and centuries old wisdom. If as Cornell West said, justice is what love looks like in public, how might justice be expressed in the Twin Cities right now? We would like to explore this together. We also have an invitation for you, for you, to join us online at commongroundmeditation.org and to collaborate, 
Let us know if you are in an organization or community with a similar goal of creating less suffering in the world. We want you to know, we want to know you, to become friends, and perhaps that the conditions work with you towards transforming ourselves and our world, towards solidarity, peace, and justice, the Common Ground Meditation Center Mindfulness Community. So that's Common Ground's love letter to Common Ground and the wider mindfulness community here. So it's your love letter to each other and our love letter to you. And perhaps in the spirit of understanding precepts and ethical training and how we use our bodies and minds and speech, well, we can also take this love letter as perhaps a uh, a set of trainings themselves. Right? Something that we might reflect on and understand deeply. How, what is it like to set some resolve, some intentions, and create some resolve around these ideas? So thank you for listening tonight. And I'd love to hear, I think we'd all love to hear from each other now, or each other meaning not Shelly. <laughs> so please feel welcome to just unmute yourself. tough for everybody and so we're all doing what we can and it feels useful to you know it was hard during the debate my mind was reactive too I, I was watching that happen I had a lot of resolve to watch with as much presence and sensitivity and care as I could and moments you know like naturally reactivity arises and so we don't want to condemn the heart that you know that is reactive this is you know often that reactivity is related to something important worth knowing right it's often related anger can often be related to a sense of injustice so we don't want to like oh that's there's something wrong or bad with us for doing that but we do want to have the skill to connect and care about that like oh right this this heart that cares is already rooted in love. And so we're already cultivating habits of love, even in the midst of reactivity. If we can remember to continue to practice and not to say, oh, screw it. You know, this is, I'm a lost cause or whatever, or this is too tough. Like, no, how about now? Like, this is our practice needs to be useful for us in every moment of our life and in the most complicated moments. And the Buddha, from the Buddha on down, people have lived through amazingly difficult times. Amazingly difficult times. And so one way we can think about the times that we're living in is like with a lot of despair. Or another way we can go like, dang, human beings are crazy resilient. Look at all we know how to do. And even when we don't know what to do, somebody says, let's do a Google document and write a love letter. Okay. And a bunch of people jump in, right? That's a very good use of our energy. That love strong, like flexing, keeping our body strong, doing push-ups. Yeah, we need to be creative. And that's how we'll find our way forward. Being really curious about what this means. What does it mean to live in this way that I want to live? What does it mean to cultivate love even now? What does it mean to be a Sangha who has a shared vision or values and knows how to participate together? What does that mean? What does it mean to be a community right now? How do we look out for each other? All of us. 
And it is just after 10. So I'm going to ask Patrice to dedicate the merit for us again. Close us out tonight. So thanks everyone for, for being here tonight. It's really great to practice together. And we can just imagine if there's any benefit to what we've done tonight, if this has helped us, if it's made us feel more connected, more loving, that we have greater capacity, we would happily, joyfully share that capacity, that benefit with, other, with others, both with those we know and feel warmly toward and those whom we don't know or who maybe trigger some reactivity in us. Our deep aspiration is for us to recognize our connectedness, our compassion, our deep wish to live with a kind of freedom that really ennobles and doesn't harm. So may we, may we share whatever blessings, whatever gifts we have with beings known and unknown in this time and inspired by the precepts, the Manzanita precepts, realize that we do this standing with our ancestors, with the earth, and with future generations. May all beings be happy. May all beings be liberated. Well, thanks, Patrice, and everybody. And just a quick announcement. Patrice will be teaching next week, so come and hear her talk. I'll be um, traveling that day, so grateful that Patrice is willing to teach on Wednesday nights. Cool. All right. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. See you again.